we are actually, for those who were not paying attention, uh, we are actually, I will show you, we are, um, we are, we are, we are doing, we're doing a trip to Israel ourselves. Um, I'll put that up for people to see. We're dipping, we're dipping our toes. Yeah. Could you, Mike? Thanks. Uh, this is our trip to Israel that we're doing in July for the Maccabee games. Um, we are going to see if we can do this, pull it off. We know there's not a lot of, uh, time, but uh, for people who want to be there for the Maccabea games, this is going to, um, thank you, Mike. That's going to be the, uh, thank you. you got, it does not include the insurance, uh, but it does include, um, it includes, um, it includes stuff like, um, there's the registration. Uh, it includes um, all activities, obviously, uh, PCR tests. It does include, so that we make sure everyone's got the right one, uh, an optional Bethlehem excursion. And as you can see, all breakfasts, three lunches, uh, Shabbat dinner, and a special dinner on the last night. So a couple of dinners and a few lunches too. So uh, it is uh, 10 days. 10 days. So uh, 11, including the flight day, but you know, I don't like to trick people into saying it's, <laughs> it's more days than it really is. Um, so anyways, it's uh, the itinerary. You can print out the itinerary here. The cool thing about this is we're going, and this is why we had to rush it, is that on this day, you're actually going to be able to go to the opening ceremonies of the Maccabea games, which is um, really the most important to me part of the Maccabee games. That I've is, been to the Maccabee. you have? Yes, I have. Joanne has been to the yeah, Maccabee my games. My son was in them. What, really? what year? What what year? Oh, it was in Detroit. No, but I'm talking about the one in Israel. No, no. no. Well, I'm talking about going. You get to go to I, Israel. I understand, but it's still the Maccabee. Games. I know it is. No, that's very <laughs> cool. My son did not practice for it. The, the, Somebody injured themselves. Oh. I told the track coach how fast he was, but he didn't believe me. And Darren went in at the last minute, and he won. Wow. Nice. Yeah, the 800 meters. So that's very cool. So, um, so yeah, we have the ability to uh, go to the, the actual opening games, opening ceremony for the games. And it's the third largest international um, a sporting event in the world after, I think, uh, obviously the Olympics. And I think the Pan Am Games or the Pan Hellenic Games, something like that. Or the Com sorry, the Commonwealth Games. It's the Commonwealth Games. So after the Commonwealth Games, it is the third largest as far as athletes go. So it's pretty cool. Anyways, uh, we are sharing now on on uh, we are streaming. Thank yeah. you, Mike. What? Can we dedicate tonight to yeah. Absolutely. So uh, for the last uh, several months, um, several years actually, uh, the uh, Schwartz, Mike, and Mary have been saying uh, the name of Dan Zager for, uh, for uh, Misha Berach. And unfortunately he passed away um, just a couple of days ago. And um, we, uh, we're gonna dedicate the class uh, today to him. He lived a long life. He was a great uh, musician. He was an architect by trade and by work, but he also uh, got to retire and then play jazz. And that's what he loved doing until he was 91. Yeah, until just a few years ago. Up until 91, he was still playing gigs, uh, especially down in Toluca Lake. He would play down there and uh, what big band and, and uh, he played saxophone and, and uh, flute and uh, something else, another woodwind that he played. Uh oh, what was that? Anyways, a little. Anyway, so we're, we're dedicating to Dan. That was a little, that was weird, right? It was Dan. It was a, sp <laughs> it was a spike. It was a spike. We just had a little, Dan. little Dan just nodded right. into us. Uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, we're definitely going to dedicate it to him today. So uh, tonight um, we're continuing uh, with chapter thirty-one. Last uh, week we we read a chapter that was pretty long. Tonight's chapter is even a couple verses longer, which is interesting because um, you know usually chapters a chapter will be you know. 35, maybe, maybe, you know, 35, 40 verses. 
Last week was 43. This week is in the 50s. Uh, and again, the longest one? no, the longest one is 67 that's verses. Right. So we have one in numbers that's really that's long. Right. Actually, we have one in, we have one that's 80. The one in numbers is 83. The one that we read a couple of weeks ago with 67 verses was, um, was from uh, Chaye Sarah when we read about uh, Jacob, uh, I mean, Jacob, Isaac finding, um, or Isaac meeting his, his wife. The end of, of that chapter was, um, just so you can see, super, super long. So that, that was like chapter uh, 26 was 35 verses. I mean, that's the normal. This, this chapter was uh, um, 34 verses. You know, that's like a normal chapter. Um, this chapter, chapter 24, was 67 verses. So that was super long. And then again, we have one in Numbers that's 83 verses, which is the list of sacrifices that were given um, uh, by the tribes. And that's a really long verse that they just didn't want to break. So today, when we read chapter 31, and uh, I'm going to get back to it, it's um, we're going to see how Jacob separates. This is Jacob separating from his father-in-law. Um, and what we read last week, was the fact that at the end of chapter uh, 30, uh, the first chap part of the chapter was, the first part of the chapter was, uh, <laughs> the first part of the chapter was Jacob, um, uh, the first part of the chapter was them having kids and going through the 12 sons and naming the 12 sons and the one daughter, Dina. And then we read about this way that uh, um, Jacob and Laban kind of decided out who's going to get what part of the flocks. So after serving for 14 years for his wives, Jacob will now uh, will now serve for another six years for the flocks. And so Jacob winds up kind of thinking that Laban was, Laban was trying to trick him, thinking that he'd get the, the stronger, um, stronger animals. Jacob actually gets the stronger animals, learns how to breed them, not so much looking about how they look, their appearance of their of their of their um, their their fur, their 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 uh, their coats, right? But how they would actually uh, survive and how they be viable. And so Jacob figures out how to do that and genetically engineers a stronger set of flocks for himself. And so what the last part we read last week was he grew exceedingly prosperous. He got got very wealthy and he came to own large flocks and maid servants and man servants, camels and asses. So it went beyond just the flocks that he took out, the sheep and the goat that he got, the sheep and goat. He now has lots of property. He has lots of stuff, just like Abraham. It seems like Isaac had pretty was pretty successful too, that he now is successful as all, uh, as, his, as his father and grandfather. And so we pick up this week, and it says, it begins... Now, he heard the things that Laban's sons were saying. Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from that which our father uh, was our father's, he has built up all his wealth. And Jacob also saw that Laban's manner toward him was not as how it had been in the past. And then Adonai said to Jacob, return to your ancestor's land where you were born, and I will be with you. So, essentially, three things happen. Jacob sees how Laban's sons are, his brother-in-law, if you will, are treating him, that they are not happy with him. He also sees that Laban is not very happy with him. And then on top of it, God actually says to him, it's time for you to go back. And Jacob actually is told by God, it's time for you to go back. But God says, I will be with you. So Jacob might have been scared, but he's not scared anymore because God actually says, I'm going to take care of you. I'll be with you. So the next scene is a really interesting scene to kind of think about dramatically. Jacob had Rachel and Leah called to the field where his flock was. And he said to them, I see that your father's manner toward me is not as it has been in the past, but the God of my father's house has been with me. As you know, I have, which by the way, let's pause right there for a second. The God of my father's or God of my father's house, but the God of my father 
has been with me. He doesn't say my God yet. He still says the God of my father. And what's interesting is he contrasts that to some extent with your father, with my father-in-law, Laban. It's also my uncle. I see the way he's treating me and God has been with me. And he says to them, as you know, I have served your father with all my might, but your father has cheated me, changing my wages time and again. God, however, would not let him do me harm. Now, we have not heard that except for the beginning when he tricked him into marrying both of them. We have not heard that it's had happened time and again, but implied in what he had just said is that we don't have all the details. That this is not the only time that Laban has tricked him and tried to keep him there. Now, we didn't see it in the Torah, but it's very likely that Jacob, I mean, Jacob doesn't seem to be lying here. He doesn't, he says to the daughters, your dad has cheated me. And so it's happened more than once. It happened more than the time at the beginning. What else will happen with the, um, with the flocks? With the flocks. Well, there he tried to, but he didn't. Right, he wasn't he able to, to, but he tried to, exactly. What? Oh, so let's take a look. So this is a, a phrase. It says time and again. Oh. So the phrase actually says aseret monim, which means literally 10 times. Now, the reason that they, tra- they, they want to show you that literally it says 10 times which is like a million times, right? It's like what we say, what, it's happened a million times, right? I don't mean it's happened a million times. It's an idiom. Did it really happen 10 times? Most people understand that that's an idiom. So that's why they didn't, that's why they translated it that way with the word time and again. We'll see that a few other times, by the way, in this chapter. You'll see the double asterisks, which are, there's a really good one coming up where there's another idiom used. There's a lot of idiom and a lot of phrases actually used in this scene, which is also interesting because it is very reminiscent of the scenes that we're going to see in the book of Samuel with David, where we also get a lot of idiom. So Jacob continues, if he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flocks would drop speckled young. And if he said thus, the streak will be your wages and all the flocks would drop streak young. God has taken away your father's livelihood and given it livestock and given it to me. And so he says, no matter what he says, I get what he says. And God is clearly doing it. It's not just, you know, an accident. It's not just my doing. It's God's doing. And God has given me this stuff. So every time he tries to come up with a new ploy, God intervenes and it's okay. Now, again, Some of it could be based on the scientific fact that there are recessive genes and the animals don't have to come out. Their children don't have to come out like they, like they did. But the bottom line is, is the Bible seems to say it doesn't, it's not a genetic thing. It's not, it wasn't, it was a miracle. It was God doing this. So that's Jacob's words to the, to his wives. Now here's what they say to to them. Oh, no, no, he's not done yet. Sorry. Once at the time, once at the mating of the time of the flocks, I had a dream, which I saw. And again, literally, I raised my eyes and saw in a dream, which again is an idiom, that the he goats mating with the flock were streaked, speckled, and mottled. And in the dream, a messenger of God said to me, Jacob, here, I answered, Inani, right? So here, Jacob answers Hineni in a dream. So here's Jacob saying Hineni, but he's saying it in a dream to a, a malach, of a, a, a messenger or an angel of God. I'm not sure why they changed, why they translated his messenger here and not angel. I'm really not sure. Mary, do you have a translation in there? It says angel. Yeah. I'm not really sure why. they, tra- they So Mary's got the uh, King James or the King James, is that the King? Yeah, there they have the, the angel. Uh, Malach is usually an angel, which is oftentimes a messenger of God, but um, I don't, 
I, I'm not really sure why this would be an, not an angel as opposed to the angel that we're about to see, the angels we already saw with Jacob and the angel that we're about to encounter maybe today, but maybe next week. But in the beginning of the next chapter is when Jacob wrestles an angel. So it's the same word. Anyways. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I answered is Vayomer. Here they just they just translated Hineni as here, which I don't get. Yes, I don't get. What does it say in the King James? Here am I. Here am I, right? Which which is again the King James actually tried to convey, you know, the intensity and the importance of the word Hineni, not just here. Hineni, it's here. You know, here. I, the, the E at the end is an implication of I, right. I'm here or here I am. Okay. Anyways, but it is uh, definitely he Maybe the interpreters, you know, thought here I am, I answered, you know, the Dr. Seuss. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> it's not, it's not, there's no reason for it. Right. There's, it's not. It's, it's it's just doesn't even make sense given the fact that he sees other angels right. and they translated it as angel in other places. But so the messenger said, and the messenger said, note well all the he goats which are mating with the flock are streaked, speckled, and mottled. For I have noted all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise and leave this land and return to your native land. Now, Jacob has just told his wives his dream. We never heard this dream. Don't think that you missed it. We never heard this dream. All we heard was God said to him, and it says God said to him, right here, return to your ancestor's land where you were born, and I will be with you. That's what the Bible said eight verses ago. But here it's combined with the speckled and spotted, spotted, mottled goats. So there it's combined with them. So it also is important because God here says, I'm the God that you talked to before. Now it's really weird because does that mean that for the last 20 years, until he had this visitation from the angel, that he didn't speak to God? Like God had to remind him, oh, by the way, I'm that guy that you talked to. I'm that God you talked to back at Bethel when you, when you had the vision of the angels. It's really weird. And he says, I am the God of Bethel. And you, you made a vow to me, which also is like, I heard your vow, which is interesting because that's a recognition that God actually paid attention to the vow. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting, because we never heard God's response. When, God, when Jacob says to him a few chapters ago, I'm making a promise that I'm going to give you a tenth of everything I, I get when I come back, which of course now he has stuff when he comes back, that God says, remember that promise you made to me? <laughs> I'd like you to deliver, right? But you know, he says, I, I come back. He says, come back. He doesn't say, hey, you owe me those goats. He says, come back. He doesn't say, yes, you know. But he does remind him, you made a promise to me. And he says, it's time for you to come back. And this is what he says to, the, to his wives. So that's, that's the end of his story. That's his story. He's sticking to it. That's his story. And, and seriously, he really does have a sense of, I, this is my case. And this is what he's telling, he's telling his wives. And here's their response. Then Rachel and Leah answered him. And it says both of them answered him. Now, it does, says, it does say Rachel. It says her name first. It says Rachel. But it says both of them. Rachel and Leah answered him saying, have we still a share in our, the inheritance of our father's house? Surely he regards us as outsiders now that he has sold us and has used up our purchase price. Truly all the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then 
Do just as God has told you. Now, I will tell you that when you wonder why does it say in one place that God spoke to him in a dream, and here it says the it is a different word for God. I will tell you that it's most likely a conflation of two traditions. But it doesn't matter to some extent because it really is saying the same thing, which is that there was a point in time where God told him to go back. Whether Jacob, whether Jacob... Yeah. He has, if they have a share in, in, in their father's inheritance, which they already have. They say they don't. Right. Except for what he has. They, he, the daughters basically say, his wives, Laban's daughters basically say, our dad's not going to give us anything. Everything that we have is with you now. Which is probably true. It was probably normal, by the way. There's nothing abnormal about that, that, that the dad wouldn't take care of the daughters once they got married but he also they also basically say well that's our only value to him look i mean you can you could say that it doesn't speak very well about laban well we already know laban is not a nice guy but we really don't know that that by itself is any different than any other man would have viewed what they're saying could have just been the status of women once they were no longer being taken care of by their father anymore on the other hand, it's a weird situation because they've been living with their father. So that's also not normal. The fact that Jacob has been living with his father-in-law and under his father-in-law's protection actually is probably a big part of the problem here, is separating the wealth. I mean, look, this is a whole chapter of the Bible, and it's a long chapter. And so there definitely was a point here. There is a definitely a point here on the national level because we're going to see that this is actually how Abraham's family separated from Nahor's family, from his brother's family. Mm -hmm. We're going to see here how the Arameans and the Israelites split at this point. They're not marrying amongst each other anymore. There's no, this is your family and it's our family. It's now, that's our family and that's their family. It's not the abraham nahor relationship anymore isaac marrying his marrying uh his cousin jacob marrying his cousins that's they're not that's not happening anymore doesn't need to and to some extent doesn't need to happen now because there's a big big family that if they want to marry off cousins they got 12 kids that are now going to have a lot of other kids and there's a lot of cousins that they don't need those people anymore so there really is a sense now that that's not our family that's those are distant relatives now they're not our family anymore and you're going to see that so this is actually a, 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 a story about that but it's also the story i think of a family dynamic which is also we're supposed to learn from which is that be very careful when you work for your father-in-law and <laughs> be very careful when you work for when your son-in-law is employed by you and what that means when the businesses are intertwined. And it really is a cautionary tale for families, not just the nations. And so, uh, you know, keep that in mind that this is also about how uh, families deal with business and they deal with wealth and they deal with property even before uh, people pass. There definitely is a, 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 saying, a sense for Rachel and Leah, that this is not their, they're not getting anything anyways. There's nothing passing to them other than what he has right now. So um, they say, do it. God told you to do it. You do it. So they're along with them. Thereupon, Jacob put his children and wives on camels and drove off all his livestock and all the wealth that he had amassed the livestock in his possession that he acquired in Padanaram to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan, which, by the way, of course, implies that his father is still alive, which he would have been. A father that was on his deathbed 20 years ago, still alive. He would have been still alive. So he's going back home and He's going to go back to see his dad. 
Meanwhile, Laban had gone to shear his sheep, which is also a theme in our stories, shearing sheep time, which was a season, right? It was part of the season of spring, you know, when people would shear their sheep after the, after the winter and the sheep didn't need to be under their coats anymore. And at this point in time, that's what was happening. And it said that that allowed Rachel, she stole her father's household idols. And here we have the word trophim, which is the same word that we just had yesterday in the story of King Saul and Samuel, where Samuel tells Saul, not listening to God is like having trophim. It's like having idols. And here the word trophim is actually translated as household idols. What does the King James translate trophim as? That were images that were her father's. Hmm. The images. So these are idols. Now they seem to be different. And we mentioned this yesterday. So this is trophim two days in a row. And it doesn't appear a lot in the Bible. It's not the common word for idol because this referred to personal household idols, which is why they translated it as household idols. These are different than communal statues. These are different than idols that everybody would gather around and sacrifice to. These were not regional or communal or national idols. These were idols that you kept in your home, in a shrine, put them in your backpack, Took them with you. These ones definitely are portable, though we do read, as I mentioned, why this is so strange. We read about Trophim again, literally coming up in the story of King Saul in just a couple of weeks. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to read the story of King Saul, who is tricked by his daughter with Trophim. I'm not going to ruin the story for those of you who aren't coming Tuesdays anyways. But there's a wonderful story that King Saul has a daughter named Michal. And Michal is married to King David. Wow, pretty wild. Some people don't realize that King Saul was actually David's father-in-law. Oh my gosh, a story of bad father-in-laws. Just did it again. Bad father-in-laws. Uh, yeah, and we also have a story in both. People, no, you have to. People who have uh, father-in-law problems, Jacob and David. And what happens in David's story is that David is going to be killed by King Saul. He hears about it. He knows his father-in-law is about to kill him. So he sneaks out of the house. And the way he sneaks out of the house is that his wife, Michal, puts a trough, a singular trophim, puts it in the bed, and they think it's David. And then they eventually bring the bed down and show King Saul that he was tricked. A father-in-law being tricked by a son-in-law with Trophim. It only happens two places in the Bible. Very rarely do we even hear about Trophim. Yet here in the story of Jacob, we're about to read about this trickery that goes on. And later on in the book of Samuel with Saul and David, we read about Trophim. It cannot be a coincidence. Let's read what happens with the story of the Trophim in this story. Jacob kept Laban, the Aramean, in the dark. Uh-oh. Double asterisks. What's the word? Stole the mind of Laban, the Aramean. Now that's quite a word. Stole the mind. That is the word. Vaignov Yaakov et Halev. Now the word ganav like a ganif is a thief, right? By Ignov. Right. He, he stole by Ignov Yaakov et Lev, which they translated again, the word Lev, they translated as mind. But we know the le word Lev also means heart, right? Lev means heart or mind. What's the King James on that one? Unawares. That is a horrible translation, King James. <laughs> stole away unawares is what King James says. no. Uh, they went with a totally different understanding. The, the English translation here tries to keep that in mind with the asterisk by telling us, very importantly, that the word to steal, 
to steal the um, to steal the the lev is essentially like tricking them. I took their mind. I, I call it a Jedi mind trick, as we say in Star Wars. It's the Jedi mind trick where, you know, he says there were no idols here, and and you and you have to say what happened? How did he hypnotize him? But it, it yeah, stealing the lev is 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 whatever however you want to translate the word lev is literally like pulling the blind, pulling the wool out from under them or covering them, you know, covering their eyes up so they can't see what's happening metaphorically. But all of those things are pulling the wool over them, right? All of those phrases indicate some kind of trickery, some kind of, um, of, of deception. And it's an interesting phrase. It's another idiom. So Vaignov, when you steal the heart or steal the mind, that's what it, that's the phrase. So it's, it's tricking him into thinking that he's doing something else, right? So he left and he didn't tell him he was going. So however he did it, whatever the way he did it, he didn't tell his father-in-law, right? Now, of course, he fled with all he had and soon he was across the Euphrates and heading toward the hill country of Gilad, which is the northern part of Israel today. We would call it the Golan Heights. This is the part of Israel that borders Syria. So they are up in Syria by the Euphrates River they make their way down about 40 miles, 50 miles, a couple of days journey, um, eventually to the hill country of Gilad. Now, he's not there yet. It says he's heading to the hill country of Gilad. This is very important because he did not get there yet. Because on the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he took his kinsmen with him and he pursued him a distance of seven days catching him in the hill country of Gilad. So by the time he got to Gilad, that is when Laban and not just Laban, but his kinsmen finally caught up to him. So they're seven days away by the time they catch him, which is a lot different speed. If you're traveling with a lot of flocks, and a bunch of kids, and then you're traveling with your friends on horses or on camels after those people. So they probably didn't get quite, you know, they were going much faster. Let's put it that way. So a seven days journey, seven days of catching up to them would have basically maybe been maybe even twice as fast. So keep in mind that they didn't necessarily go as far as um, they didn't go as far as they would have if they were traveling light, if you will. But they catch them, and they catch them in the hill country of Gilad. And this is actually really important, the fact of where they actually caught up to them, as you're about to see. But God appeared to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream by night and said to him, beware of attempting anything with Jacob, good or bad. So God appears to Laban and says to him, don't do anything with Jacob, good or bad. Does anybody want to comment on that phrase? That's another interesting idiom, perhaps. Beware of attempting anything with him. Tov ad ra, good or bad. Does anybody want to comment on that, why that's such a weird phrase? I don't know why, but it is weird. Well, why, why would God warn Laban, don't do anything good to Jacob? You can understand God saying, you better not do anything bad to Jacob. That'd be the normal thing. Maybe he doesn't want Jacob to stay there. He wants him to leave. Okay, so yes. So don't very, good, good. very good answer, which is, don't try to bribe him to come back home. He's not meant to come back with you. Ah. Right, so that's a possibility. That could be the, that could be the. Now God, of course, knows that Laban is a is a not a good guy and you know can't be trusted and all that other stuff. So there's an interesting, I think, a very important lesson actually in that phrase, in that in those words, which again, you may have passed over if you didn't really think about it. Now there 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 is a commentary on this, which I think is a. Kind of an interesting one. Let's see if I can and show you the uh, the uh, commentaries. Occasionally, there are some commentaries. 
think, uh, no, that's not it. Here, it's this one. Um, so Ibn Ezra writes, uh, do not speak to Jacob about returning, even if you think it is for his good, which gets to what Gail said, you know. You may think it's good for him to go back. It's not good for him to go back. <laughs> and it gets to this kind of issue, which I think is, and again, let me just see if there's any, any, uh, anything more on this, that um, whether there was a Rashi on this. Yeah, here's the Rashi one, which I like. This one, this one's also quoted. He Rashi quotes the Talmud. Why should he not speak good? Because all the good that the wicked do to the righteous is evil in the opinion of the righteous. So, so there's an interesting idea that, you know, bad people are going to do bad things, and the good and good people know it. And and there's a, I think there's a teaching in this which is pretty interesting too, which. Those of us who are trying to do good things should remember, which is that when people who have a propensity, and I'll say is a propensity or a desire to do bad things, do bad things, they oftentimes don't think they're bad. <laughs> we know they're bad. We know that people are doing really bad things to themselves, to other people, to people we care about, and we know that they're doing bad stuff, but they don't think they're doing bad stuff. A bad person oftentimes doesn't think they're doing bad stuff. I won't say a bad person. A person who's doing bad things and has a propensity to do bad things oftentimes really doesn't think they're doing anything bad. So Laban, who maybe, again, we could say has a propensity for doing bad things. I don't want to call him a bad person, though he is generally regarded as a bad person. They oftentimes don't think they're doing anything wrong. So rather than us trying to change those people's minds or uh, attempting it at, 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 at even arguing with them, it's best not to even engage with them. And so God warns Laban, don't even start. Don't start with them. And so, you know, God knowing Laban's, you know, inclinations to do bad stuff, basically tells him, don't even try. Don't even think you're doing something good for him. Don't think you're trying to help him, which again gets to Gail's point, which is, you know, he, he, he's going to want to try to talk him to staying with them and bribe him and try to be good to him and try to get him to, to, to return, uh, which is very good for Laban because Laban, of course, is very worried that as soon as Jacob leaves, his whole life will go to hell. That all the good luck that he's been having with Jacob is going to go away. That all the flock increase that he's had because of Jacob and because, of course, because of God is going to go away. Everything's gone. At least before, and by the way, before when he didn't even have to split his stuff with Jacob, he was totally getting the benefit of Jacob's blessing. The blessing that Isaac had given Jacob. That blessing he was deriving benefit from. So he does not want it to go away. And even if he was going to try to do something good, it really is something bad. Bad people who, do, I don't want to say bad people, people who do, who do bad things don't think always that they're doing bad things. Maybe it's a, a cultural thing too, because Levon is, is um, Rebecca's brother. And she you know, chose to de de deceive her husband with her, the son that she liked. You know, I, Maybe it's a cultural, in that culture, it's okay to lie and steal the cheap stuff. Well, remember, Jacob does so too, right? And yeah. Jacob, and remember, Jacob is half Aramean by that, you know? And so this is not, yes, this is maybe him not being around that anymore. Um, but yes, and God wanting him to come home. Yeah. So uh, God has warned Laban. The question of whether Laban fully understands that well let's see laban overtook jacob jacob had pitched his tent on the height which again is the goal on heights and laban and his kinsmen encamped in the hill country of gilad and laban said to jacob what did you mean by keeping me in the dark and carrying off my daughters like captives of the sword notice by the way 
carrying off my daughters like captives. Of the sword, by the way, too, like being forced. <laughs> you forced them. You took them hostage. Why did you flee in secrecy and mislead me and not tell me? I would have sent you off with festive music, with timbrel and lyre. He is a liar. He's not. <laughs> he's not a liar. He's not going to timbrel and lyre. Yes, but that's the word betof uvechinor, and we would have sent you off with shirim, with songs. Not likely. Not likely. Not likely. So um, that's what he says, though. You did not even let me kiss my sons and daughters. And notice what it says. Sons and daughters. Which they see as a stock phrase. Notice where you see that stock phrase. The book of Samuel, my friends. Interesting. I also see it in the prophet Nehemiah. But it's a, not a common phrase. It means my grandchildren too, which he considers him his children. My grandchildren. You didn't let me say goodbye to my grandchildren. It was a foolish thing for you to do. So he's blaming Jacob. Again, there's no sense that he's responsible for this at all. You know, he doesn't recognize that Jacob was fearing for his life oftentimes living under his roof. I have it in my power to do you harm. But the God of your father's house said to me last night, beware of attempting anything with Jacob, good or bad. So he actually repeats to him the same phrase, good or bad. Don't do anything. So he does say to him, I have it in my power to do you harm. And that seems to me to be a threat. Mm -hmm. Pretty much a threat. It is. So, so the the implication is is that Jacob, by that phrase, really, why would he not have left? When you have a father who says, "I could hurt you right now," that is not a good situation. It, he just proved his point. He proved Jacob's desire to get away from him with with uh, in with in secrecy because who needs that? Who needs to have somebody now saying, "I can I can still do you harm." And the assumption here is that Jacob does not have the man the manpower to fight with these people that have shown up now to say, you know, I could I could hurt you. So there seems to again be a threat, and the implication is and it's not just an implied threat that we have enough people here that we could do some damage. Very well, you had to leave because you were longing for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? So in that last phrase, Laban basically says, okay, you had to go back to your father. But why did you take my gods? Now that is a legitimate claim. Mm -hmm. At this point now, he's confronting Jacob with a legitimate grievance, which makes Jacob look bad. No doubt. That Jacob looked bad. And Jacob answered Laban, saying, I was afraid because you thought, because I thought you would take your daughters from me by force. Okay, that's the answer to the first part of it. But anyone with you who you find your gods shall not remain alive. In the presence of your kin, point out what I have of yours and take it. And then it says, Jacob did not know. Rachel had stolen them. And what's interesting about it is that we have that word again, ganav, like ganav, ganav tom, that she had taken them, that she had stolen them. So Jacob didn't know. Bible says flat out, he didn't know. Now, before we get into this, Jacob just cursed his wife. On one hand, he literally said, let that person be killed. Now, it seems as though he's, he's saying, if someone's taking your gods, kill them. Knowing that he didn't do it. Um, and by the way, he doesn't say my trophy. No, he, doesn't. he says, you took my gods. He doesn't say you took my idols. 
He says, you took my gods. You didn't take my statues. So he's, he's freaking out because he also now believes to some extent, well, he had a visitation from God, which by the way, you know, let's comment on that for a second. God spoke to a non-Israelite. God spoke, God spoke to uh, a guy who we know is not an ethical guy, not a good person, if you will, or doesn't act, be, doesn't behave well. And yet God spoke to him. Now you could say, well, God had to speak to him. But I always want to know, how did Laban know it was God? Why did he believe him? Clearly, believe right. Clearly the experience of God speaking to him, he, he, he seems to know, right? He knows. And he, interestingly though, he doesn't say ever, it's my God. He says, right. your God came to speak to me, which is weird because, you know, even though like if, 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 a God came and spoke to me and I knew it was God, I would, that would be my God at that point. I'd be like, I just, God just spoke to me. A God just spoke to me. I mean, that you wouldn't think that would happen very often. I mean, why would there, like, what's, what's more to say at that point? You just got, you just talk to God. So it's kind of a weird thing that even that doesn't convince him to give up the idols. Cause at that point you could say, why does Laban even want his idols back? He just talked to God the creator of everything. He wants his stupid idols. So on one hand, it kind of shows that he's stupid because he's still asking for the idols. Give me my idols. Well, you just talk to God, literally like the day before. You talk to God. What do you need stupid idols for that don't talk to you? you the creator of everything just talk to you. So that's a little weird. But then it gets to the point of what did, what, why did Rachel take the idols in the first place? What was that about? I bet we'll find out. I don't know. <laughs> let's let us let us finish the story and you tell me if we find out. Well, they seem to be a little annoyed that they have to get an inheritance from their father. Maybe they saw some value in it. Okay, so I hope you heard what Mary said. Did everyone hear what Mary said? No. Say it a little louder, Mary. Right. So maybe again, these idols, as Mary said, is this is what they get to take. This is their inheritance. They took something from the house. It's a possibility. Well, let's read what happens. Very famous scene right here. So J uh, Laban went into Jacob's tent and Leah's tent and the tents of the two maidservants, but he did not find them. Leaving Leah's tent, he entered into Rachel's tent. Rachel, meanwhile, had taken the idols and placed them in the camel cushion and sat on them. And Laban rummaged through the tent without finding them. So it's a very dramatic scene that Laban is rummaging through the tent. He's turning it upside down, right? Like the police do in the movies, right? He's throwing stuff around and looking for the evidence. She said to her father, let not my Lord take it amiss that I cannot rise before you, for I am in a womanly way. <laughs> but he could not find the household idols. So she is sitting on the idols. She does not get up when her father comes in. She does not get up when he's looking around. And her excuse is, is that she is having her period. That is why she's sitting down. That's her excuse. And of course, she, she's sitting on, well, she's sitting on, she's sitting on them. So they don't want anybody to, now, there's a lot of explanations here of what happens. I will tell you that the next thing is, now Jacob became incensed and took up his grievance with Laban. And Jacob spoke up and said to Laban, what is my crime? What is my guilt that you should pursue me? You run through all my things. What have you found of all your household objects? Set it here before my kin and yours and let them decide, be, let them decide between us two. And then he says, uh, well, let's, that's the end of the, the idol scene. There's no more idol scene. 
He basically says, you looked through all the stuff, you didn't find it, you didn't find the idols, and you didn't find anything else. You found nothing. Now, of course, the idols were there. But we really don't know why she took him. I mean, the Bible doesn't say. There are answers given beyond Mary's. Well, Mary's was a good one, which is that they wanted to have something of value. And these were something of value. They knew these were of value for their dad. So there's a lot of possibilities. Let me also say that there are differences of, of opinion whether Rachel was really lying. Because there is a stream of this, whereas Rachel is a hero because she takes away her dad's idols and literally puts them underneath her menstruating body, which is the absolute most disrespectful thing you can do with the idols. So if that's a possibility, she's completely correct. The whole thing defiles the idols and they're over. So that's the understanding that the idols, she took them because she wanted to defile them and to upset her father. That's one possibility. There's the other possibility on the other extreme, even beyond what Mary said, but kind of building on that, which is that they were of value to their father. Their father believed that they brought him blessing, and now they've taken them. That Rachel and Leah really, or at least Rachel, really believed that these idols that they had in their house that they were raised with did have value, and that they did have power. So there is that possibility on the other extreme that Rachel really believed in these idols. Either that or she thought it was her inheritance. Or yes, and that she deserved these, which is, of course, you can make the argument, her dad's not dead yet. So you don't start taking that <laughs> before he dies. It also that he really loved Jacob and wanted to get back with her father for what her father did to Jacob. Yes, which also, though, follows to some, some extent one of two possibilities. As Mike just said, maybe he wanted to get back, she wanted to get back at her dad. Listen, if any one of the daughters has any reason to resent the father, it's Rachel. Yes. Leah has nothing really to resent her father for, because if anything, Leah could make the argument that she got on a husband that she wasn't otherwise going to have. Right. That's a possibility that Rachel did it to finally get back at her that's dad. What, that's what to me at least seems like. It's very possible. But, that, but then there's one of two possibilities. So let's say that it's Rachel getting back at her dad, which is why Rachel took them and not Rachel and Leah. So if Rachel did it to get back at her father, then there's one of two possibilities. One, she took them because she believes they are powerful and that her dad not having them is going to cause her dad even more grief. Also, it doesn't even matter because her dad believes that they're real. The dad believes that they're powerful. And just even if she doesn't believe it, it's going to really make her dad mad. That's another possibility. There's another possibility, which is even again, another possibility, which maybe goes more along the lines of her not hating her dad, feeling sorry for him and kind of teaching him a lesson is that she wants him to know that these idols are worthless and meaningless. And the only way he's gonna know it is if she actually takes it from him, which doesn't really follow the line that she's doing to him a disservice, but she's actually helping him by taking away these idols from him. Look. There's no question that Laban is not happy that the idols are gone. Even after he's talked to God, he wants his idols back. Otherwise, he wouldn't go through this whole process of doing it. And to some extent, it proves, I guess you could say, it proves his grievance against Jacob for theft. That if he took the idols, what else did he take? And, and Jacob is basically saying, I didn't take anything, even your idols, which quite frankly, Jacob would say, I have no need for them. All of this is, is again, most amazing given the fact that the Trophim follow, there is a story of Trophim later on, which deals with Rachel's descendants, Saul and Michal. Again, a woman from the Rachel family. So all of this is, is very interesting, is very, um, is, it's got a lot of foreshadowing. And if you think about it, is, is, is fraught with meaning and with and with um, lessons because there is a horrible thing that just happened here, which reminds us for those who, who are on the Tuesday morning class, so we read a few months ago, the story of Jephthah, where Jephthah curses and basically inadvertently curses 
his daughter to death by saying the first thing that comes into my house, I'm going to sacrifice. And of course, it winds up being his daughter. Here, Jacob, to some extent, just said, whoever did this is going to die. And so to some extent, he just cursed his wife to death. Inadvertently, accidentally, he didn't mean to. And how does she die? How does Rachel die? Childbirth. Giving birth. Childbirth. Yeah. Giving birth. In the way of women. Now that ought to give you chills. Because she claimed that she couldn't get up because she was in the way of women menstruating when that's what happens when you don't have a baby and here she had a baby and died assumedly in a bloody death giving birth that's not a coincidence that was a powerful scene of a woman essentially being cursed by her own husband to revisit this weird kind of experience of when she said she couldn't get up because she was menstruating. Um, so we're not going to read that today, but it is coming up real soon. <laughs> Benjamin is the only one of the children that's born in the land of Israel. Because we didn't read about them. We only really read about the 12 children being born, 11 boys and one girl. Um, it's a tragedy that, again, has several things moving here that, that um, we see the, those elements popping up later. So here's Jacob's kind of Jacob and Laban's separation, if you will. So this is chapter, we're not done yet. Those 20, these 20 years I've spent in your service, your ewes and your she-goats never miscarried, nor did I feast on rams from your flock. That which was torn by beasts, I never brought to you. I myself made good the loss. You exacted it of me, whether snatched by day or snatched by night. Often, Scorching heat ravaged me by day. And again, there's a little note here, which is kind of weird is I was scorched by, by heat and ravaged by day and frost by night. We're going to have to figure out what's going on there. And sheep fled and, and sleep fled from my eyes. Of the 20 years that I spent in your household, I served you 14 years for your daughters and six for your flocks. And you changed my wages time and again. And again, <laughs> here we have the 10 times. You've changed my wages 10 times. So he says again, 20 years. And he says it two times. I have served for 20 years. <laughs> How's the 20 years computed? 20 years, 14 for your daughters, seven years for each, and six years for your flocks. Now, I will tell you, he also got two handmaids in the, pa in the pa package too and a player to be named later. But he got, he didn't get a player to be named later. He got <laughs> lots of kids, but he did get, he did get a, yes, he did get a conditional draft pick. He got two other women that he had kids with. So it was, you know, look, it was 20 years though. And it's a good chunk of his life. I mean, it was basically his prime years of, of, of earning wages. Because remember, he came there when he was 40. He's now 60 when he's leaving. So he's literally spent, you know, essentially, I mean, the math is pretty simple. He's spent a third of his life working for Laban. Now, again, he was also establishing his family. He was, so his oldest kids by this point are, you know, probably 17, 18 years old. Reuben would be about this point. So <clears throat> he, uh, he's, um, he, you know, he, he looks back on his life and he says, you know, it was not easy. I was out there in the weather. I was out there in the elements. And um, it was not easy working for you. So again, this is where you start to see this theme of working for your family, in particular, working for your father-in-law, which, you know, it happened. 
it happens even to this day where people go working for their for their father-in-laws and there's people who work for their you know they're not they're not in the they're not outside you know with the sheep anymore but they work for their father-in-law's law firm or they work for their father-in-law's accounting firm or they you know they they're they're in their father-in-law's practice and they you know they have to deal with their they have to deal with the the repercussions of essentially being you know at their at their father's direction their father-in-law's direction so it's not an easy thing for 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 Jacob and again there's this issue that his father-in-law has constantly changed his wages and not made it easy for him again to some extent we understand that part of the trick that Laban was was playing was to keep him there and not let him go and to keep him now the interesting thing about this too is that Jacob says something very interesting in this too which is that whenever there was a loss amongst the flocks, he covered it, which means that if, if they had an agreement where these are your flocks and I have to, you know, I get a certain amount of the flocks, if there was an animal that was taken by beasts, that he covered it, it came out of his. He didn't split it half and half with them or 30, 40 or 30, 70 or 30, 40, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the arrangement was that he got with what he got to keep. Any losses, he says, came out of my half, came out of my portion, not even half, my portion. I made good on those. And what's interesting about it is he says, any of them that were torn by beasts, I never brought to you. And there's a really interesting foreshadowing in that, because that's exactly what his sons say to him when they bring him Joseph's coat. And they take essentially a sheep's, you know, the blood of, a, of the sheep and put it on the, on the coat and bring it to their father that he was that Joseph was torn apart by beasts. I'm not there yet. No, no I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ruin it for you, no. but I will tell you that this this scene of beasts tearing up an animal and the repercussions of that definitely play out in that scene mm -hmm. where Joseph mm -hmm. is essentially, you know, takes the place of those animals, and it's that being torn apart by beasts which Jacob is actually confronted uh, confronted with. So this is um, this is a very, very difficult scene for Jacob. And it's Jacob's finally, you know, essentially finally telling his father-in-law where to get off. And he doesn't tell him to him until he literally had run away. So the question is, did Jacob ever intend to tell Laban this? Or was he just going to slither off, slink off, whatever, and never confront him. They never would have had this conversation. That's kind of the, you know, that's kind of what uh -huh. we're kind of left with, which is he never would have confronted him. Like he, Jacob didn't want to have this conversation. Now you could also say he didn't want to have the conversation in Jacob's backyard because he was worried that he'd get killed. That's a possibility. And again, it seems to be a legitimate one based on what Jacob said when he says, I thought you, you know, when, when Laban says I could kill you or I could hurt you, you know, Jacob is right for being scared. So Laban definitely, as you can see, is scary enough, scares Jacob enough that Jacob might never have even confronted him. So 20 years, this is 20 years. And then this is actually uh, this last part of his, of, of his statement. Had not the God of my father's house, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac, by the way, which is, you see the note here again, which is pachad, means fear. They say it's uncertain. Why does it say pachad? What does the King James say? The dread, the fear, okay, had been with me. You would have sent me away empty-handed, but it was my plight and the toil of my hands that God took notice of and gave judgment on last night. And so what he said, Jacob says to Laban is, the reason that God came to you and spoke to you was because God knows that you would have stolen everything from me and sent me away with nothing. Essentially, again, that's the kind of guy you are. And God took judgment. God was with me. Yeah. And so that's why God told you to leave me alone. So it's a very, very dramatic scene. It's really one where, fortunately, again, Jacob knows, I mean, 
Laban told him, your God came to me last night, or your, you know, your, your, your God told me not to, not to do anything to you. So Jacob, you know, Jacob says, that's why. Laban spoke up and said to Jacob, the daughters are my daughters, the children are my children, and the flocks are my flocks. All that you see is mine. Yet what can I do now about my daughters or the children they have born? Come, let us make a pact, you and I, that there be a witness between you and me. So Laban's answer is, they're all mine. Everything you have is mine. But he says, there's nothing I can do about it. He says, I can't do anything about it. But he doesn't give up this assertion that everything, he never says to Jacob, you're right. You have a legitimate, you have a legitimate claim, legitimate rights. You have legitimate stuff, do you? No, he never says that. Instead, he says, what can I do? He essentially says, you got me over a barrel because my daughters and my grandchildren, they're gone. They're done. We're, they're, I have to bring them back. I can't bring them back now. And so his answer is, let us make a pact. And this now will cross over into the national story. And this now is a story that tells us how the Israelites and the Arameans, the Syrians, separated from each other. And it's, this becomes a national story. So this now is leaving the realm of a family to the story of these two nations. Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar, a matzeva. So he made a pillar. And Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. So they took stones and they made a mound. And they partook of a meal there by the mound. Laban named it Yagar Sahaduta. But Jacob named it Gal Ed. And so they made a very important monument here. A border, if you will. The pillar, a matzeva, a pillar, which is also, by the way, like a headstone. It's like a, it's like a stone monument or stone, you know, a stone marker. And Jacob, by the way, said, says to his kinsmen. So is he talking to his children? Is he talking to his, it says his achiv, it says his brothers. So is he talking to his brother-in-laws? Are they, are it's really not, it says kinsmen, but the reality is they make a meal, they have a meal, and they make this marker, they make this boundary. Now, what's interesting about it is you see it from the note, Yagar Sahaduta is a mound of witness. So those two words, Yagar, which means a, a mound, and Sahaduta, which is very similar to the Hebrew word edut, which means to witness, is the Aramaic name for it. So here we have a, an Aramaic word. And later on, of course, Jews actually become primarily Aramaic speakers. By the time, again, of the Roman period, especially during the time of Jesus, people spoke Aramaic, including Jesus, throughout the land of Israel. But at this point, Aramaic is really the language of Aram, is the language of Syria. In Hebrew, the thing was called, this mar marker, is, it's, it's a mound. Same word, gal, ed, the word for witness. Gal, mound of witness, gal, ed. And this, according to, again, this meaning is how we get the word, the name Gilad, or again, this area, Gilead. So that's where the name Gilead comes from in Hebrew, from a mound of, of witness, a mound, stones of witness. Now, the Aramaic word, the Aramaic name, is, means the same thing. But they have a different, you know, they, it's a different name because one is in Aramaic and one is in Hebrew. So again, it's, it's what the, 
It's what that place, uh, what that marker, what that boundary is called. Uh, again, the, the language of Aramaic is, is uh, will eventually become the primary language of that region, not Hebrew. Um, and not just, again, in, 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 in Aram, in Syria, but in that whole region, in what is today Israel. Okay. What? Yeah, the, the Kaddish, right? The, the Kaddish is in Aramaic. We don't have a lot of texts in our world that are in Aramaic, but for our, our ancestors and for uh, uh, generations of Jews, the Talmud that we have is written in Aramaic. So Aramaic was a very important language to us. Uh, there are a lot of Aramaic words that kind of filtered their way into it. And Aramaic, I like to describe it as really kind of an intermediate language between Hebrew and Arabic. Now, Aramaic is older than Arabic, but Arabic is much closer to Aramaic than it is to Hebrew. So they're all similar. They're all Semitic languages, but Aramaic is kind of a transitional language between Hebrew and Arabic. And so um, people who are, are who are Arabic speakers oftentimes would have a much easier time understanding Aramaic than they would Hebrew uh, and vice versa. It's kind of an in-between language. Um, the only people that, and there are very few of them left, the only people who are uh, still native Aramaic speakers are uh, Mandaeans and, and Syriac, people who speak Syriac, which are essentially Christians who live in the Middle East. Uh, some live in uh, Jordan and some live in, in Iraq and in Syria. And they're the last people who speak this language, Aramaic. They're, the language is a living language is essentially dead. And all the people who speak Aramaic virtually today, not everyone, but virtually everyone who speaks Aramaic today speaks Arabic. And, and probably very soon, there, are, there won't be any people who only speak uh, Aramaic as a, as a living language. So um, this is an explanation for this boundary. And it's not over. The, the boundary... The boundary situation here is what the last few verses uh, deal with here. You see how important it was. Laban declared, this mound is a witness between you and me this day. And that's why it's called, uh, named Galed. And it was called Mitzpah because he said, may Adonai watch between, and again, there's a little note here, the word watch, which is from the word Yitzef, Yitzef, which is connected to the word Mitzpah which mitzpah literally means a place of watch. It's a fortress. It's a high fortress that you look out on, a citadel, if you will. Um, but the, but the, the place was also called mitzpah because it's a place where we will watch over each other and make sure that nobody crosses the border. So it's very much like the Golan Heights today, which is the boundary, the barrier between Israel and Syria to make sure that the Syrians never cross over that boundary again. So that, those heights are also uh, very important for, uh, for uh, keeping the peace, if you will, today. So uh, the word mitzpah or mitzpah is a, uh, a citadel, a place where you can watch from. It's actually also the basis for the city in Israel, Tzfat, right? Which Tzfat is a place up in the mountains where you can look down and see lots of things from it. So tzfat is also from the word mitzpah, or mitzpah, or tzafa, which means to look out, to be able to see, a place where you can keep an eye on the other person. So uh, here you have the, the uh, here you have the reason for this to be, um, for this to be a place of, of uh, watching over each other. So, yes, as, as, uh, as Francine just pointed out, there are not many people that speak Aramaic or, as she just pointed out, Yiddish either. Uh, both of those languages were, uh, were, were losing both of them within the Jewish world, uh, most of the Jewish world, except, of course, in the Orthodox Jewish world, where the Talmud is still studied in, in, uh, in Aramaic and Yiddish is still being spoken as a living language by those people who are living in the yeshivas uh, in the yeshiva world as well and the language that oftentimes is used for conversation is yiddish and that the language of the, of the uh, study is oftentimes in aramaic and of course in hebrew but all the talmud virtually well i mean all the the gemara part is is in uh, is in aramaic so um it is those are languages that uh, people 
many Jews would know Aramaic, Hebrew, and Yiddish, and what other language they spoke in their country, whether it was Russian or Polish or, or Greek or Turkish or Arabic. They'd oftentimes also know, they wouldn't know Yiddish if they knew Arabic probably, but they would know Aramaic and Hebrew. So Rabbi we, Mark, did you have to learn Aramaic? I, I, I did, and unfortunately, um, I think they don't we, don't, we don't learn it well enough in the non-Orthodox world. So there's kind of an assumption that if you know, if you can read Hebrew and you know Hebrew, that you'll, that you'll, you'll make your way through the Aramaic. And so there is a, there is a, there's a dictionary, an Aramaic dictionary that, that most. Oh, it's close enough. Yeah. The Aramaic, the Aramaic dictionary, I got, I got a lot of use, I got a lot of usage out of the Aramaic dictionary when I first started rabbinical school. But uh, by the time I was done with rabbinical school, they worked out a really good translation of the Talmud that made it so that uh, busting your, your teeth on the Aramaic became less and less uh, necessary, which was probably not good because I probably would have been stronger in Aramaic. But on the other hand, very rarely does anyone ever ask me anything where I need to know Aramaic. So <laughs> I, 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 wish, um, I wish that uh, I did know it better, but I, again, I, I don't... I, it's not been a, it's not been a, uh, it's not, I've not been called on to do much. In, in <laughs> you haven't this, needed it. No, <laughs> nobody's asked. Nobody's Thank asked, goodness. Nobody's asked for me to translate anything in Aramaic, but it's mainly because it was only used for, for holy text. It was only used for a prayer. Right. It was only used for, for the Talmud. So it's not like when people come to me, sometimes they ask me to translate something in Hebrew, or they'll ask me to translate something in Yiddish. Uh, I wish my Yiddish was better so that I could translate more in Yiddish, but I can translate enough that I can read a little bit. And then if I, if I need help, I can send it out to friends who, who, who have much better Yiddish skills than I do. But um, the, the Aramaic was, was, uh, was so rarely used by people on a, on a day-to-day basis by Jews, at least for the last 2000 years. Um, you know, these other languages like Yiddish or Ladino, were much more common than, than Aramaic for, for the day-to-day life of Jews. But yeah, during the time of, of Jesus and the time of Greco-Roman Israel, uh, that was definitely Aramaic was the standard language that the people there on the streets of Jerusalem spoke. Thank you. So it tells you how uh, many languages Jews have, have, have been speaking over the years, including again, even in Israel. So, and by the way, the reason we know that is because the Dead Sea Scrolls, a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls are actually in Aramaic, the ones that the people were using for their common everyday discourse were oftentimes, or the or what we call the Peshitas, the, the Targums, the translations and the commentaries that they wrote, that the Dead Sea community wrote were, were in Aramaic. So we know that they spoke Aramaic because their translations of the Torah were, were, were actually into Aramaic. So they were not into Greek, they were in Aramaic. So here at this place of, of uh, of Galad or Gilad or Gal Ed originally, uh, or Mitzpah. Here's the part that again uh, Laban says, which is very interesting. Doesn't seem so creepy actually. If you ill treat my daughters or take other wives besides my daughters, though no one else, and here it says a little bit, or participant, one of the witnesses to this agreement, um, be uh, be about. Remember. It is God who will be witness between you and me. And so Laban actually says to, um, says to him, uh, actually, no, sorry. It, it's, um, it, yeah, when Laban says this to him, um, uh, he says, if you, if you don't treat my daughters well, or if you take any other wives, and no one's there to see it, God will see it. Well, that's, that's kind of, that, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of special. And he says, and Laban said to Jacob, here is the mound and the pillar, which I've set between you and me. This mound shall be a witness. And this pillar shall be a witness that I am not to cross this to you past this mound and that you're not to cross to me past this mound and this pillar with hostile intent. Now it doesn't say you're not allowed to cross it. It says you're not allowed to cross it with hostile intent. That's what it says. That's what it says. Um, so 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 you 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 understand 
that there is a definite sense that they're not exactly sure that they'll be good neighbors. They're not exactly sure that they're going to be good neighbors. But they're not fighting. And they are, uh, hope, hopefully, again, the recognition that they will not, uh, they will not um, go to war against each other, their descendants. And may the God of Abraham's house and the God of Nahor's house, their ancestral deities, judge between us. And Jacob swore by the fear, and again, here's the word pachad, of his father Isaac's house. And this moment is really, again, the one where we see the national differences between them. Because there they say Abraham's house and Nahor's house. This is now different houses. These are different families. These are different peoples. These are not the same house anymore. These are not all Terach sons. These are Abraham's people, and these are Nahor's people. And that's it. And it says, of course, their ancestral deities, which is weird because we just said that this is God. But I will tell you, there are two versions of these stories that have been woven together. I don't want to get into it and pick them apart, but it is pretty clear that these are kind of repetitious and that there are slightly different versions of them, but they really get to the same point, which is, this is your side of the wall. This is my side of the wall. Let's not cross over. Let's not fight. That's your way. This is our way. We have different gods. We have different ways. And this is it. This is a separation. And again, we're not going to be marrying each other anymore. There's not going to be any of this stuff anymore. This is a separation. Jacob then offered up a sacrifice on the height and invited his kinsmen to partake of the meal. After the meal, they spent the night on the height. And that's the way the chapter ends. As you can see, 54 verses, pretty long. That's a really weird way to end the verse and uh, the chapter. And that's why I say that this verse definitely goes through it. Early in the morning, Laban kissed his sons and daughters and bade them goodbye. And then Laban left on his journey homeward. That's where I would have ended the chapter. That's just my, that's my take on it, because that's the end of the story. They didn't like that. They wanted it to be the end of the day, and that's the end of the thing. The next verse is, Jacob went on his way, and messengers of God encountered him. Now, that's where I would begin the chapter. It does? So we don't even actually begin the next. It's 54, verse 54. Wow. So the King James has a verse 55 on that, which is interesting because that means the Protestant version or whatever, the version <coughs> that we're using doesn't have that. Um, I will check that out, why it's uh, different in, in uh, different versions of the Bible. But yes, this, this line is Jacob leaves and then, and then that's it. And by the way, the note here is sons and daughters, which again seems to be, again, a, a repetition of that idea that his grandsons, he calls them his sons. Right. Which, by the way, is a you know, nice way of recognizing that his, his grandsons, he, he, was, he liked his grandsons. You know, he was proud of his grandsons, I guess. And he goes home. And of course, <clears throat> they had this meal together and, uh, and goes home. What the Mike says wonders what the meal was, the last meal, their last meal together. Well, the reality is, is that it is the last meal that we could see that Laban ever has with his family. So it is the last meal, if you will. They're not going to spend any more time together. I mean, it doesn't say that they won't. It doesn't say that they can't. It says they can't cross over with hostile we intent. Know, we, don't have any sons had. we don't. We don't know how many sons Laban had. We have no idea how big his family was. But Laban goes home. And then it says that Jacob went on his way and messengers of God encountered him. Which again, Mary, what does it say in the King James? Angels of God encountered him. And it says right there, Malachi Elohim. Uh, 
whatever they were, when he saw them, Jacob said, this is God's camp. And he named that place Machanaim, which is a plural of the word Machane, a camp, which, by the way, usually isn't a camp that you go to for the summer. It's not your summer camp. It's not a campground where you're going to bring your RV. I would like to see Jacob bring his RV. His RV, Jacob's RV. No. <laughs> a machane, machane is usually a military camp. It's usually a camp where people are while they are fighting. And we still use the word interchangeably. We still use the word uh, military camp for that. Uh, but Jacob calls the place Machanaim. It really means camp. I mean, camps, if you will. Machanaim is a plural. <clears throat> but, you know, Machane Elohim, you know, this is God's camp. Uh, so Jacob knows that whatever he saw, which is why, why would you call them messengers of God? I don't know. He sees angels and he calls them. He calls the place God's camp, Machanaim. That's the first place, essentially, he comes to in the land of Israel. I mean, he's up in the heights, so he's up in that border area. Now he's back into Canaan, and he calls the area God's camp. And what does he see when he comes into the land of Israel? Angels. He saw angels when he left, and then the first thing he sees when he comes back into the land is angels. So he sees angels on his going out, and he sees angels when he comes in. So he knows that this is a special place. He knows that he's back home. He knows to some extent that this encounter that he has is a divine sign. Now, he already talked to God. God already even talked to Laban. So this isn't crazy that um, angels are, are around here, but he does see angels when he left and now when he comes back a couple chapters later. So, this is the way the Torah portion by Yetze ends. Now, I will tell you, just to blow your mind a little bit, by Yetze begins, the Torah portion that we just finished, begins with Jacob going to Aram. That's the way it began. All of that is in one portion. It's a lot of stuff. That's why exactly, that's why it's so important to do what we're doing, because we would have rushed through this without really being able to absorb what just happened, which is just in that last chapter, the, the relationship that Jacob and Laban have and rehash the last 20 years of their relationship that he just went through and, and, and gave us a sense of, you can't get that if you rush through it. And so here, when we come to the end of, the, of this portion, there's an interesting thing that happened, which is that it began with the angels. And now it ends with the angels. And these are the bookends for this story. Mm -hmm. So that is important when you consider like what's in the portion and how it begins and ends with angels. What's interesting is, and again, this maybe you can make the argument, is where the Torah portion also kind of does a disservice is because, and this is where this chapter understands the way the chapter is organized, that this angel scene doesn't end here. This is the beginning of the angel scene. So the way the Torah portion laid it out, it's bookended by angels. But if you came back and read the story next week, you forgot, oh, well, yeah, you told me the story begins and ends with angels, but this is the beginning of the angel story. You'll see why. Um, so, well, this is a tricky one, but we're, we're going to start this story. Jacob, uh, Jacob sent messengers, and again, this is the beginning, just so you can see, the beginning of chapter 32. Jacob sent messengers, which is why it's Vaishlach Yaakov. Now, here's the weird thing. 
Here, what does it say? Jacob said? What's the word? Yeah, Jacob sent messengers ahead to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. The Hebrew right there, and look with me, is Vaishlach Yaakov Malachim. The word messenger here makes a little bit more sense to translate as messenger, because are we supposed to assume that Jacob has the power to send angels? Maybe. The problem is, is the word is actually the same. Her messenger so it is the same word but it is possible that he did send angels the rabbis at least in the midrash say he sent angels who else is he going to send on such an important mission of reconciliation than angels and how could he send angels well hello in the previous verse it just said he saw a bunch of angels so he could have <laughs> so He's, he's sending angels. Yes, it's a lot safer, as Mike points out. If you're going to send people to his brother who might kill them, it'd be much easier to send some divine being that wouldn't be afraid of the brother. So if I saw an angel, I could send it somewhere? I don't I know. So. If, you, if you were, if you were, if you were, uh, if you were uh, Jacob, maybe. I don't maybe. know. But the, but the, uh, but the possibility exists. The weird thing is, is if you read this as Torah portions, it's not as, it's not as noticeable. It just flows. If you read it as the chapter does, then it really does. Because it just said, Jacob saw messengers of God in encounter. Uh -huh. And so when it says Jacob sent messengers of God, it could be there again, the messengers of God. Uh -huh. So it doesn't even, <clears throat> we have to recognize it's the same word. And you, there is it is the same word now it does okay say, it does say here in this line it does say um it does say uh um it does say malachia elohim it does say messengers of god so it yes, doesn't elohim. say it doesn't say elohim here in all fairness it doesn't say it. so <clears throat> but there it, no matter what no matter what, if you look at what just happened, it is very possible that they were okay. Angry. But it says, he instructed them as follows. Thus shall you say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob. I, and again, the note says here, to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, or thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, I stayed with Laban and remained until now. I have acquired cattle, asses, sheep, male and female slaves, and I send this message to my Lord in the hope of gaining your favor. So he says to him, I've done really well while I was away, and I'm sending you this message, my Lord, in the hope of gaining your favor. And he uses the word Adoni which is the word we use for Adonai, right? Now, it's not the word yud heh vav -Heh. It's not the name we don't pronounce, but it is the word Lord. It's the word that we actually say, right? We say Adonai, my Lord. So he says to him, to my Lord. He uses the word there two times. To my Lord Esau. And he also says, of course, I am your servant, Avdecha. I am your servant. So he completely puts himself in a subservient position. There's no question that Jacob is really trying to be humble with Asa. So why do you think? What do you think? I'm going to reach. <laughs> okay. So, you know, look, there's no question that he says, I'm very successful. He says, I've been very successful. But he still recognizes Asa's dominant position. Or at least gives it gives Esau the feeling that he has a dominant position. The messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau. He himself is coming to meet you. And his retinue, his retinue, men, men, and his men, 
number 400. He's got 400 men coming with. Now, the note here makes it less scary if it's 400 people. But the word ish is what's used here, which, again, doesn't have to be men. It could be people. But it is also, there's 400 men coming. There's 400 men coming with him. Now, Jacob clearly understands this did not be a good situation. Because Jacob was greatly frightened. In his anxiety, he divided the people with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two camps, thinking if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks him, it attacks it, the other camp may yet escape. So he, there's no question he's scared. He says he's scared. It says he's scared. Um, and he says, let, let, I'll split my people into two. Then only half of them will be destroyed. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, that's what he's, his, his thought here at this time is maybe I can save half my people. Do we know exactly how many followers Esau has at this time? How many people? Well, it says 400. We do, we, bring him 400. We, yeah, we don't know how many more he had. No, we don't. Now, it is a possibility that he doesn't have 400 people, that he's hired 400 people. <laughs> These are people that he's... That he's I mean, the only reason why I say that is I'm still not understanding why Jacob would even care to contact his brother. They don't really get along. So Mike's question, in case you didn't hear, or Mike's comment is, why did he even send a note to him when they don't get along? Like, why didn't you just leave him alone? Right? So he is back in town. He is back. So Mike, Mike's point is, why did he even let him know? Couldn't he have just left it alone? So that is, uh, that's what a lot of people do. I mean, why not, right? Leave him alone. Don't, don't even tell him. Well, it's interesting because you could say, yeah, that would have been a smart thing to do. Leave him alone. There's one problem though. The messengers came back saying, he is coming to meet you. Now, the rabbis point out, that he, and the Hebrew is not really clear. He's already on his way. You sent a message to him. Before we even got there, he's coming to meet you. Now, we don't know that's for sure. But when it says that he himself is coming to meet you, Jacob definitely feels that the message is, I don't come in there to give you a hug. I'm not coming there to give you a kiss. I'm coming there to kill you. And I've got 400 people. Because why does he have 400 people? You don't need 400 people. If you're having a reunion, there's not 400 people coming. He's not bringing 400 people to sing along. So, so there's a real feeling here that Jacob just got out, got out of the frying pan and into the fire. He just left Laban and a, a scary situation, and then he crosses the border, and now he's got another scary situation. So he had Laban on one side, and now he's got Esau on the other. Now, what's so interesting about this, of course, is that this is literally the predicament of the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years. So do we go back to Europe? Do we go to, do we go to the Ottoman Empire? Do we go to here? Do we go to there? Where are we going to go that people are just going to leave us alone? Honestly, I mean, this was the Jewish, the predicament that Jacob is in, for thousands of years, Jews have read this portion, and whether they lived in Poland or Austria or whatever, you said, well, what's going to happen? We're going to go there, and they may chase us out of that place. And that was the predicament that Jews were in for the last 2,000 years, until literally, you know, the, maybe you could say the 1800s, when Jews finally came to this country and found a place where they weren't going to be chased this is this is this is why of course israel became so important because even after the united states was established we found that not all the time would the united states be 
open to Jews when they were trying to survive, as we know, from the 1930s. So you can't go anywhere without worrying. He's very worried. He says he was greatly frightened. And so what does he do? He splits his, his, his stuff up, right? And that's his, that's, his, that's his line of reasoning. It's like, at least I can save half my family. And there were people who did that. There were people who did that. There were people who did that during the Holocaust, where they said, at least I can get one kid out. Mm-hmm. No, and they didn't know what was going to happen to that kid. So... Um, so this is the this is the problem that Jacob is faced with. Where does he go? And Jacob said, "O God of my father Abraham's house, and God of my father Isaac's house, O Adonai, who said to me, Return to your native land." And I will deal bountifully with you. I am unworthy of all the kindness that you have so steadfastly shown your servant. With my staff alone, I crossed this Jordan, and now I've become two camps. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. Else I fear he may come down and strike me down, mothers and children alike. Yet you have said, I will deal bountifully with you and make your offspring as the sands of the sea, which are too numerous to count. And so Jacob prays to God. And again, the prayer starts off with God of my God of Abraham, God of Isaac. And now, of course, he calls Abraham his father. Abraham's his grandfather. But you can see, again, we don't really have a word for grandfather. So he says, Avi, he says, my father. Avi Abraham, velo Avi Yitzchak. So he says, Abraham, Isaac, and now, of course, we say Jacob, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. And here you can see he says God of Abraham, and he says God of Jacob. He doesn't say God of Abraham and Jacob, and and Isaac, sorry. He doesn't say God of Abraham and Isaac. He says God of Abraham, God of Isaac. He calls God out two times as saying, you're the God of, of Abraham, and you're the God of Isaac. He doesn't say you're the God of Abraham and Isaac. Because again, there's this understanding that we have in Judaism, and we say God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, God of Sarah, God of, that God appeared to each one of those people differently. That God's experience, the godly experience that Abraham had was different than the God experience that, that Isaac had and the experience that Jacob had. They were all different. And so he recognizes that, and that's what we recognize when we say the Amidah today. We recognize that God appears to every human being differently. So my version of God, my vision of God, even though there's only one God, is not the same. And so this is this is kind of the origin of that tradition that God is um, God appeared differently to to them. And so he says that, and he says, you know, he recognizes that this is God. This is God who appeared to my ancestors. And he of course says to God, "You told me to do this." Right? So he doesn't just say, God, help me, please. I mean, she does in a beautiful way. But well, he doesn't just say that. He says, you told me to come back, God. I'm doing what you told me to do. Okay, so I'm afraid, afraid, but I'm doing what you told me to do. And you said, you'll deal bountiful. You'll, it'll be good. And, you, and, and, and then he says, I'm unworthy of the kindness. So he also says in humility, I don't deserve this. He doesn't say, well, you know, I've done everything you said. Please just cut me a break. He says, no, I'm not worthy of it. I'm not, there's nothing that I've done that's worthy, but you know, you've, you have shown kindness to me and I came with nothing to Aram. And now I've come back with enough to even split myself into two. So this recognition that he's done this is also a recognition of how blessed he is, that he has the ability to now split his camp up into two. And of course, then he says, this is my brother. And he's going to kill, he has the potential to kill everybody. Men, women, and children, women and children. And um, 
And you can't let that happen, God, because you promised me that you're going to make me numerous. And if I'm dead, and if my whole family's dead, then you can't live up to the promise that you made. So you have to keep us alive. And <laughs> we wouldn't be reading this right now. Right. After spending the night there, he selected from what was at his hand these presents for his brother Esau. 200 she-goats and 20 he-goats, 20 ewes and 20 rams. Oh, there it is, the rams. Perfect timing for Super Bowl. <laughs> you wondered how that was going to come up. 30 milk camels and with their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls and 20 she-asses and 10 he-asses. And these he put in the charge of his servants, drove by drove, and he told his servants, go on ahead and keep a distance between the droves. So this is a lot of stuff. I mean, this has a huge value of stuff. I mean, this is literally years worth of, of flocks that he just gave them. So even if he had a lot, I mean, even if he had a thousand sheep, which would have been amazing, he gives him gives him 20% of his, he gives him 20% of, of, or 25% of his goats. Seems like, you know, he's giving him 25% of his, of his, of his, uh, of his sheep. I mean, I mean, that's assuming he had a thousand. It could have been more. It could have been 50% of what he had. It's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff for, I mean, for 400 people, assuming that even Esau had more than 400 people, which we don't, we can't assume that he had more than 400 people in his camp by then. But whatever he has, this is a tremendous amount of, 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 of flocks. It's a tremendous amount of flocks that, that Jacob had then when he was coming back. He's coming back with quite a lot. And what he says is, is, take this to him. He says to the servants, take these things to him and put space between them as you drive them. Which, of course, is very interesting because he's actually making it look even bigger, right? If you just lump everything together and you drive it to him, it's just going to go, so what? You know, there's a lot of stuff. But here comes this stuff, and there comes this stuff. And it just comes away after a wave of things. And again, like, it's going up in value, too. You know, cows and then bulls. And I mean, it's like, it's really just a whole lot of value because it's not just the sheep. It's also camels and cows and bulls and asses. And these, right, this is a huge <laughs> ramps. It's so Aaron Donald. Uh, people with big contracts. It's a lot of stuff coming to them. And he instructed the one in front as follows. When my brother Esau meets you and asks, who is your master and where are you going? And whose animals are these ahead of you? You shall answer your servants, Jacob. They are a gift sent to my Lord Esau. And Jacob himself is right behind us. He gave similar instructions to the second one and the third and all the others who follow the droves, namely, thus and shall you say to Esau when you reach him. And you shall add, and your servant Jacob is right behind us. For he reasoned, if I propitiate him with presents in advance, then face him, perhaps he will show me favor. And so that's what he says. He says flat out, I'm going to try to buy him off. And the way to buy him off is not, again, just to give him everything at once, but to give them to him and then give them more and then to give them more. And he goes, oh, then there's more. But wait, there's more, right? And they do in the commercials. <laughs> they do for the, for the, uh, for the uh, Ronco items. And wait, there's more. And, and these things are going to make him feel good. These are going to make Aesop feel good. And so the gift went on ahead while he remained at home that night. And... Uh, are we going to read a little bit more? Uh, yeah, we'll read a couple more. Why? No, I got to keep you. I told you. I want to now have very good, very good uh, cliffhangers. That same night, he arose and taking his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons. And if you notice here, it says his children, Yeladim. Um, reference cannot include Jacob's daughter. Why? Because it says, 
Echadis Rei Yaldav, 11 children. So where was Dina? There's a midrash, there's an explanation for that, that he hid her special. He hid her real good so that Asaph couldn't find his daughter because he did not want Asaph to find his daughter. He didn't want Asaph to have Nina. And I've told you this before. It's a very, very twisted midrash because the midrash is, is that if Jacob had not withhold Dina from Esau, and Esau would have married her, would have been brought back into the family, and then Dina wouldn't have gotten raped later on. I didn't told you I didn't like it. But there was this understanding that maybe Dina could have been the piece that would have united the two peoples together. I know, but it's all based on where's Dina. Why isn't she mentioned? She's being, she's in San Diego, my daughter. So, so uh, after taking them across the stream, he sent them across all his possessions. And that's where I'm going to leave it off. Because the next part is the, that's the next part. The next okay. part, the next part is more angels. The next part is more angels. And I can't, we can't get into that now. It's too much. Anyways, folks, it's, uh, it's, it, it's great to have you. We have to figure out why our screen flickered a few times. I, I don't know. It was a sign, but that's never happened yet. But uh, maybe we'll check the connections. But uh, it was it was it was great having everybody here. Uh, please stay uh, stay upbeat and positive, everybody. We've got um, yeah. It was great to have everybody here with uh, again all of our different locations uh, locked together and being part of one family together. So. And uh, it's good to see you all. Yep. Thank you, Harvey. How, Harvey, how's uh, how's Washington doing? Harvey, I guess. Harvey, you're on mute. He's he's on mute. Oh no, he's see somebody can hear him. Anyways, okay. I I'm on mute. No, we're enjoying <laughs> the weather. Is. Enjoying it. It's different and it's nice. We're enjoying it. Good. Well, Nobody's everybody. helping us unpack it. <laughs> oh, we miss you. Thank you. We'll be back soon, we hope. To that visit. would be good. I need a visit. And I owe you some, some help on your gardening. I know that. I fixed the iPad so you could see it. Okay. We'll get together. Very good. I look forward to it. Okay. Thank All you, right, Harvey. Everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank Have a good evening. Good night. Good night. And good night. thank you, Rabbi. Thanks, Rabbi. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.